Thanks for tuning in once again, everyone. You're listening to the Maritime History Podcast. I'm Brandon Huebner, and this is episode number nine, The New Kingdom, Maritime War and Maritime Peace. First off today, thanks to those of you listeners who've left kind reviews on iTunes since the last episode went live. In particular, thanks to users Werestyra, SharkMGS1, TWL586, Soli Deo Gloria 7, and Urban Anchorite. It's quite encouraging every time I see a new review of the show, and I'm very grateful to have such a great community to share the podcast with. In that vein, I wanted to let all of you know why the podcast episodes have been a little bit more sporadic than they were initially. During November especially, I was focused on law school exams, with a job on top of that, and then holiday traveling got in the way of earnest podcast study and preparation, so hopefully you'll forgive me for the dearth of episodes the last few weeks. Now that Christmas is over, traveling is done, and another semester of regular schedule is about to begin, I should be able to get podcast episodes a bit more regularly. Right before we delve into the discussion for today, I also wanted to tell you about a podcast episode that you should take the time to go listen to right after you finish up here today. Joey Brunel runs a history podcast named Born Yesterday, and his most recent episode about sea shanties is a must-hear episode. First off, Joey's presentation is top-notch. Add to that a full episode about the history of sea shanties, complete with recordings and examples, and you have a terrific episode. Since we're currently still stuck in the ancient myths of maritime history on our podcast, go ahead and check out episode 18 of the Born Yesterday podcast to get a potent fix of 19th century maritime history. As for us here today, let's head back to ancient Egypt and pick up where we left off last time, the Second Intermediate Period. We saw how the Middle Kingdom declined around 1750 BC, a point that was relatively contemporaneous with the death of Hammurabi, the decline of the First Babylonian Empire, and the drying up of Mesopotamian sea trade. While the Persian Gulf trade of Mesopotamia steadily declined over a period of 150 years or so, Egypt entered the Second Intermediate Period rather abruptly. We saw how the decline of the Middle Kingdom may have steadily led to the cliff where that abrupt drop happened, but once the drop happened, Egypt's long-distance sea trade also fell off precipitously. From the death of Sobek Neferu, which ended the 12th dynasty, Egypt underwent a fracturing of power that saw several different dynasties ruling at the same time. Then, around 1650 BC, A weakened Egypt was easily invaded by a warring people known as the Hyksos. They actually established their own dynasty, the 15th, and they gained a large measure of control over most of Egypt. But since there's practically no maritime evidence connected to the Hyksos, I'll have to leave a discussion of their invasion to some of the other fine podcasts out there covering ancient history. I say that there isn't a lot of maritime evidence, but there is one interesting maritime reference connected to the Hyksos. But other than that, it's sufficient to say that Egypt remained fractured and under the partial control of the Hyksos until approximately 1550 BC, when the last two 17th dynasty Theban kings, Sekinenre Tau and his son Kamos, led the Egyptians in a final victory over the Hyksos to accomplish Egypt's liberation. One of those two kings, Kamos, is the king who we have to thank for the maritime evidence from the end of the Second Intermediate Period. Two stelae connected to Kamos both recount the king's efforts to wrest cities in Middle Egypt from the control of the Hyksos. Kamos' strategy was to carry out a shock and awe campaign against the Middle Kingdom towns that supported the Hyksos, hoping to win them back easily and weaken the morale of the Hyksos without too much cost to his own forces. 
The Carnarvon tablet tells us that Kamos wisely utilized the highway of the Nile to move at least part of his army north to the city of Avaris, a focal point of his campaign. The tablet records Kamos as saying, I sailed downstream a victor to drive out the Asiatics according to the command of Amun, my brave army in front of me like a blast of fire. A second stele attributed to Kamos goes into further detail about just how exactly he utilized boats in his attack of avarice. I put in at Per de Jekin, my heart happy so that I might let a poppy, who was the Hyksos king also known as Apophis, so that I might let a poppy experience a bad time, that Syrian prince with weak arms, who conceives brave things which never come about for him. I arrived at Yenet of the southward journey, and I crossed over to them to greet them. I put the fleet, already equipped, in order, one behind the other, in order that I might take the lead, setting the course with my braves, flying over the river as does a falcon, my flagship of gold at their head, something like a divine being at their front. I made the mighty transport boat beach at the edge of the cultivation with the fleet behind it as the sparrowhawk uproots plants upon the flats of avarice. It appears then from this inscription that Kamos used transport boats and smaller ships as amphibious vessels to launch an attack on the city of avarice, fighting from the ships onto the land, rather than from ship to ship as in a naval battle. The conclusion of the inscription gives us the impression that Kamos was successful in his attack, although some scholars have said that Kamos may have inflated the records of his accomplishments. Imagine that. The Stellite goes on to quote Kamos as boasting, I have not left a plank to the hundreds of ships of fresh cedar which were filled with gold, lapis, silver, turquoise, bronze axes without number, over and above the moringa oil, incense, fat, honey, willow, boxwood, sticks, and all their fine woods, all the fine products of retinue. I have confiscated all of it. I haven't left a thing to avarice, to her own destitution. The Asiatic has perished. Kamos's reference retinue in the previous inscription actually refers to a location in southern Levant, so it's obvious that goods from the Levant were still traveling up the Nile, even during the period of Hyksos' control. But these inscriptions from Kamos give us our best glimpse into the state of maritime trade during the Second Intermediate Period, even if they also happen to record the moments that the period was in its last stages. When Kamos died, he'd accomplished much of the task of driving the Hyksos north. His successor, Amos I, is seen as the first pharaoh of Egypt's new kingdom. Also the first king of the 18th dynasty, Amos I spent his reign working to reestablish a centralized government like those that had existed in Egypt's past. Once the government was again solidified, the earliest pharaohs of the 18th dynasty focused all of Egypt's resources on expanding territorial control once again. In the south, they waged a campaign to retake control of Nubia, a campaign that was waged on land by and large. The northern campaign saw the Hyksos pushed north, back to their original home in the Levant. As Egypt followed on the Hyksos' heels, the 18th dynasty pharaohs added more and more northern territory to their kingdom. By the time Thutmose III took the throne in 1479 BC, he led numerous military campaigns to take control of more territory to Egypt's north. Thutmose III pushed so far north that Egypt technically controlled territory in southern Syria. However, Egypt had become so extended by reaching that far north that Thutmose's administration of his territory in the Levant was dependent on his maintaining control of the port cities, like Byblos and Ulaza. This situation is revealed to us in the text of the Napata Stelae, also sometimes called the Gebel Barkal Stelae. 
It gives us Thutmose III's northern campaigns against the Hyksos and the Mitanni, a group that rose to power in the region of central Mesopotamia on into northern Syria. The Stelae describes Tutmos sailing to the northern border of Asia, where he ordered that many ships be built of cedar from the mountains of God's land in the neighborhood of the mistress of Byblos. In preparing for his Syrian campaign, the Stelae tells how every harbor his majesty came to was supplied with fine bread, various breads, oil, incense, wine, honey, fruit more numerous than anything beyond the comprehension of his majesty's army. I really appreciate how that line ends by saying, and that's no exaggeration. After describing his victory at the Battle of Megiddo, the Stelae also describes how Tutmos required tribute of his subjects. All chiefs of Lebanon built the royal boats in order to sail south in them and bring all the precious things of Lebanon to the palace. The same Napata stelae, named after the city of Napata in Nubia to Egypt's south, tells of Tutmos's exploits on the southern front in Nubia, where the stelae was actually discovered. After describing his victory over the Nubians, the stelae describes how Tutmos also required tribute from his Nubian subjects. They pay me tribute as one man, being taxable millions of times in numerous things on the top of the earth, much gold from Wawat, its amount without bounds. One built there for the palace every year, eight boats, and many transporters for the crews. Beside the tribute, the Nubians bring ivory and ebony. Precious wood from Kush was brought to me as beams of down palms, and wooden things without number as acacia wood from the Southland. My army made them in Kush, which existed there in millions, besides eight boats and many transporters made of down palms, which my majesty had fetched by force, one built for me in Jai, every year, from genuine cedars of Lebanon, which were brought to the palace. Depicted evidence of the tribute being received by Tutmos during his reign can be found in the tomb of his vizier, a man named Rekmire. His tomb at Luxor is lavishly decorated and abounds with painted depictions of events from his life. One depiction shows him making a journey by ship to go receive a decoration from the pharaoh. Perhaps the more historically important image from Rekmire's tomb, however, is the depiction of the various people groups who paid tribute to Tutmos III. Among them, the Nubians are clearly identifiable as bringing various African animals that are common to the area that was then called Nubia. The Syrians are also identifiable by their commonly depicted style in ancient Egyptian imagery. The most interesting group is a group that's bringing gifts of vases and small statues. The style of dress and hair with which this group is depicted has led many scholars to identify them as natives of Crete, an island that would at that time still have been under the control of the Minoans. Egypt called these people the people of the isles in the midst of the sea, and the possible connections between Egypt and the Minoan civilization are fascinating, but I'm going to go ahead and leave those until our discussion of the Minoan civilization itself. And with that, we're also going to transition from looking at Egypt's territorial expansion during the New Kingdom, an expansion that admittedly relied on the Nile and on the supply routes to the Levantine port cities. Our second and final topic for today involves a woman pharaoh who reigned concurrently with both Tutmos II and III, an Egyptian queen named Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut was by far the most successful female pharaoh in Egyptian history, and her reign, beginning in 1478 BC, is seen as peaceful when compared with the reigns of her predecessors. Her reign was a time when Egypt began to re-establish its foreign trade connections following the occupation of the Hyksos and the foreign trade hiatus of the Second Intermediate Period. Hatshepsut herself was responsible for a large part of the foreign trade renaissance, and a relief from her temple at Deir el-Bahri 
gives us some marvelous insight into a voyage that Hatshepsut launched in the ninth year of her reign, so somewhere around 1469 BC. What's marvelous about this base relief is that it gives us our best information about the land of Punt, since that's the place where Hatshepsut sent this particular expedition. Not only is there the information about Punt, but this relief is also important because the intricacy of the relief also gives us a wealth of information about the construction of the ships and even about the type of marine life in the waters over which the voyage traversed. The fish in the relief are carved in such detail that modern ichthyologists are able to identify the species of fish that the Egyptian artist intended to depict over 3,500 years ago. In its entirety, the relief tells a story in several scenes. The first couple scenes at the bottom of the relief show the departure of the fleet from Egypt. There appear to be five ships total, three of them still at sail with their square-rigged sails unfurled, while two of them are slightly further ahead and seem to have arrived at Punt already. Their sails are stowed along the ship's yards, and a smaller boat, laden with sacks and large jars, is seen making its way to land after being dispatched from one of the larger ships. The text above the anchored ships describes the scene. Sailing on the sea and making a good start for God's land. Making landfall safely at the terrain of Punt. Based on the number of rowers aboard one of the ships, 15 to a side for 30 total rowers on each ship, we can estimate that the ships used in Hatshepsut's voyage to Punt were roughly 23 meters long, or about 75 feet. The ships themselves highly resemble the Egyptian ships of previous centuries, ships that we've discussed in previous episodes. They each have a hogging hauser to add stability to the hull, while the boom and yard on each ship are curved, possibly to help the sail gain an optimal level of curvature when capturing the Red Sea winds while at sail. Aside from the depiction of the ships themselves and the marine life they shared the Red Sea with during their voyage, the relief is also important for its depiction of the land of Punt and the goods that Egypt traded for at the far end of their voyage. The scenes in the middle of the relief show Egyptian sailors carrying goods from Punt back to the ships. The text describing this scene says that the Egyptians were loading the ships very heavily with the marvels of the land of Punt, with all kinds of good herbs of God's land and heaps of nodules of myrrh, with trees of fresh myrrh, with ebony and pure ivory. The list also includes items like gold, wood, incense, animals like baboons and hounds, not to mention the servants that Egypt took back with them from Punt. The scenes depicting the return journey show the ships heavily laden with the goods listed. Potted myrrh trees sit on deck, surrounded by full sacks and jars, while baboons walk along the hogging truss. The Egyptians' attempt to transplant living myrrh trees from Punt back to Egypt is seen by some historians as possibly being the first recorded attempt in history at transplanting live trees. In describing the arrival of the fleet at the Karnak Temple, the inscription states, Voyaging and arriving safely, making landfall at Karnak Temple joyfully, by the royal expedition, accompanied by chiefs of this land. They have brought the like of which has not been brought to other kings, from the marvels of the land of Punt. If you remember your Egyptian and Red Sea geography, you may be wondering how the fleet sailed from the Red Sea over to the Karnak Temple at Thebes, a city that's located on the Nile River. Well, the canal of the pharaohs that I briefly mentioned in our last episode wasn't constructed at this point in Egyptian history, so the only feasible possibility is that the ships and the goods they carried were transported across a wadi and back to the Nile. As you'll remember from our discussion of Egyptian maritime history, this was a common practice dating all the way back to the Old Kingdom, so it's a pretty safe assumption that even Hatshepsut's voyage to Punt did the same thing 
in the New Kingdom. The concluding few scenes of the relief show denizens of the land of Punt bringing the goods of their homeland before Queen Hatshepsut, bowing down before her and saying, Hail to thee, King of Egypt, Lady Ra, shining like the solar disk. A final interesting tidbit from the Punt voyage relief is that Ramses the Great, a pharaoh who reigned several centuries after Hatshepsut, attempted to remove her name from the relief and put his own in its place, probably in an attempt to claim the glory of the voyage. Despite his best attempts, archaeologists weren't fooled. Therefore, we can know for sure that Hatshepsut was the one who was really responsible for the voyage to Punt. If you're interested in looking at the relief in detail, and in seeing a scene-by-scene explanation of exactly what's being depicted, the PBS documentary series Nova has a great breakdown of the relief on their website. I'll be sure to link to it on the show notes for today's episode on our website, if you're interested. In 2009, Cheryl Ward, a maritime archaeologist at Florida State, and a crew of university students embarked on an 18-day Red Sea voyage aboard a reconstructed Egyptian ship. This project gives us a good glimpse at just how advanced ancient Egyptian maritime technology was. The reconstruction was largely based on the depiction of ships from the Hatshepsut relief that we just discussed, but other information came from fragmentary artifacts discovered at the Egyptian Red Sea port of Mursa Gawasis, in addition to hull measurements of the Dasher boats. The reconstruction was named Min of the Desert, in honor of the Egyptian fertility god depicted on shrines at Mursa Gawasis. The 30-ton reconstruction measured 66 feet long, and the construction techniques themselves were almost exactly like the techniques that we've already seen in our jaunt through ancient Egyptian maritime history. The hull was constructed by using individual planks fastened with unpegged mortise and tenon joints. Linen fiber and beeswax was used as a sealant to waterproof the plank edges of the hull, a technique that isn't readily evidenced by ancient Egyptian artifacts, but is still entirely feasible for them to have used. The square linen sail, the mast and rigging, and the hogging truss are all modeled almost exactly from the depictions of the Hatshepsut Punt ships. Min of the Desert also contains two quarter rudders, as are shown in the relief from Hatshepsut's temple, where the rudders are lashed to stanchions to help steer the ship, even in a strong wind. Perhaps the only major difference between the relief and the reconstructed ship is the use of rowing oars for propulsion. The reconstructed ship relies mainly on the sail for propulsion, and according to Miss Ward, even she was surprised by the speed and stability with which the square-rigged sail carried the ship. However, the ship was outfitted with rowing capabilities, though this would primarily have been used only to maneuver the ship in and out of anchorage positions, and not as a main means of propulsion. I'll also post some pictures of this beautiful ship on the website if you're curious what a 21st century interpretation of an ancient Egyptian ship looks like. The relief at Hatshepsut's temple at Deir el-Bahri is generally seen as the best evidence for Egypt's connection to the land of Punt, and it's among the most well-known of all Egyptian temple reliefs and tableaus. From the time of Hatshepsut's voyage, forward through history up to the epic clash between the Egyptians and the Sea Peoples, there isn't a whole lot that's unique in the way of maritime evidence. Before we wrap up the episode for today, though, I do want to point out one interesting theme that maritime historian Lincoln Payne draws from the Egyptian depictions of Punt. If you remember our last episode and the supplementary telling of the tale of the shipwrecked sailor, then you may recall that the serpent on the island with the shipwrecked sailor claimed to be none other than the prince of Punt. When the sailor attempted to garner the serpent's favor, by promising to lavish him with the riches of Egypt, the serpent laughed at his foolishness, 
saying that Egypt's wealth was nothing when compared with the wealth of Punt. Then, in today's look at Hatshepsut's voyage to Punt, we again saw that even the New Kingdom Egyptians had a high demand for the myrrh and the wealth that still existed in the land of Punt, while the natives of Punt were simultaneously depicted as subservient to the awesome Egyptians. Payne points to this theme, Egypt's desire for Eastern wealth while feeling superior to the Easterners, as perhaps the first depicted occurrence of a theme that continues to this day. Western nations have continually complained about a wealth of goods coming from the East, cheapening the worth of Western-produced goods. Modern complaints about trade imbalance come to mind, while medieval and Renaissance fascination with the exotic wares of the East also follow along with the theme. It's a bit early in the podcast still, and a fair portion of the East-West trade took place on land, but go ahead and keep an eye out for this theme to crop up again in future episodes of the podcast, especially as we get closer to modern topics. Hatshepsut's voyage to Punt brought us up to 1478 BC, and from there, a few notable mentions will bring this episode to a close. The first comes from the tomb of Hoy at Kurnat Murai, Thebes. This wall painting is dated to 1360 BC, and it depicts one ship that's basically the same as the ship from the Punt voyage of Hatshepsut. The Hoi ship is the same shape, though it lacks the stylized stem and stern. Both ships contain square-rigged sails, quarter rudders, rowing oar outfitting, and relatively simple rigging. The main difference with the Hoi ships is that their decks contain what seem to be cabin-type shelters, where the ships in Hatshepsut's temple only contained raised portions guarded by railing. Our second notable mention, which should be plural, really, comes from the famed tomb of Tutankhamun. From King Tut's tomb, Howard Carter pulled 14 different boat models, all of them in pristine condition. Again, while none of these models contain any features that we haven't already discussed at some point, they do make beautiful examples of the way New Kingdom Egyptians decorated their boats and ships. King Tut's tomb contained small ceremonial boat models, but one model in particular gives us a full-color glimpse at a ship that's highly similar to the Hatshepsut and Hoi ship depictions, even if the model is a bit smaller. There's even a boat that we mentioned early on in the podcast, a papyrus reed canoe, that was taken from the tomb, and shows us that the simplest of boat designs remained in use throughout history, even to this day. Images of the Tutankhamun boat models will also be posted on the MHP website for your viewing pleasure. And with those last few artifacts from the New Kingdom, our episode today is about out of steam. Although the Hoi depiction and the King Tut models came from about 1360 BC, not much changed thereafter, until the Late Bronze Age collapse began to affect Egypt, starting around 1200 BC. From there, the Sea Peoples enter the narrative, and I think that the wholesale transition that took place during the Bronze Age collapse in the Mediterranean and the entire ancient world is probably best left to a series of episodes all to itself. Just to give you a rough idea of where I plan to take the podcast in coming episodes, Here are my thoughts. I anticipate our next episode looking at a specific use of ships throughout all of ancient Egypt's history, that is, ships used as heavy transport vessels. We've already seen the many uses of ancient Egyptian ships, including transport of smaller goods and even timber from Byblos, but the Egyptians made frequent use of ships to transport their stone and supplies that they used in their monumental building projects. The unique aspects of transporting such items by ship should fit well into a single episode, though it may be a bit shorter than normal. After that, I plan to circle back around to earlier periods and look at some of the civilizations that we haven't yet turned our focus on. Civilizations like the Minoans, 
the Mycenaeans, and the earliest glimpses of the Phoenicians. The Indus Valley Civilization, along with a few other people groups, are known to have had maritime capabilities by virtue of their mention in the histories of Egypt and Mesopotamia, but hard evidence of Indus Valley maritime history is more scarce than anything we've looked at yet. I'll try to get an episode together to cover some of the more scarce topics, but I'm not quite sure where it will fit best. Really though, once we look at these few civilizations, we'll be back up to the watershed moment of ancient history, the Late Bronze Age Collapse. The Sea Peoples play a role in that story, so maritime history does as well. Once we get past that, we'll be on into the period where we can look at the Phoenicians in earnest, and also begin to see the rise of the Greeks and the emergence of the first true maritime civilizations. All that to say, we won't be hurting for subject matter in the least, and I hope you'll stick around as we're getting to more and more interesting topics. That does it for us once again here today. Be sure to come back for our next installment, but until then, thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast.